Це регулярний досвід ще з експертами різних країн Європи, Європейського Союзу. Я хочу вам сьогодні представити пані Ліс Ченелс, це національний експерт проєкту Європейського Союзу «Твінін». Вона з Великої Британії. І пан Барто Шота, це національний експерт, теж проєкту Європейського Союзу. Він з Польщі. Тематика буде така – стратегічне управління, стратегічне планування, використання ресурсів. Ну, я думаю, що вони вам дещо розкажуть про себе, про свій досвід. Ну, і в залежності від того, яким буде результат вашого спілкування, ми будемо мати можливість продовжити їх лекції I'm going to begin by telling you a little bit about me, my background, and then my colleague Bartosz will tell you a little bit about himself and his background, and then we will crack on with what we want to talk to you about today. You will find that because I'm a native English speaker, I may use phrases which are um, a bit too colloquial. So just then I said crack on. Does anybody know what I mean by crack on? What I, what I mean is just to make, make progress, crack on, it's, a, it's casual, language, casual language. If I say things that you don't understand, there is no shame in putting up your hand and saying, say it again in a different way, please, Liz, because I'd like to understand. Is that agreed? Yes. I, I know your English is very good. I know you have to pass a high level of English to be a participant in this important course. So, but nonetheless, nonetheless, I want everybody to understand. Let me tell you a little bit about, about my background. I spent um, over 30 years as a British civil servant. Um, I joined the civil service as a researcher doing research into um, management techniques and personnel management in an organisation um, which was like this. It was the training centre, the central training centre for central government civil servants. I became a member of the teaching staff and I started to train. I spent uh, many years training civil servants in a range of topics all related to management. Not economics, not law, not even public administration, not social policy. All to do with management. Managing people, managing resources, so that as a civil servant I could my students could manage a team of people, manage a department of people, manage a ministry of people effectively. After a long period of doing that, I then um, became head of human resources management in the cabinet office. The cabinet office in England, in the UK, is the office of the Prime Minister. Um, it had about 3,000 staff in the office of the Prime Minister. So I had a lot of people I was recruiting, promoting, firing, training, looking after generally. And I did that for four years at a time of uh, change 
in the United Kingdom. When after, oh, I can't remember, 17 years of Conservative government, we had a new and very energetic and exciting um, left-wing government. So it was a busy time. After that, I moved into a different field, still in the civil service, which was the field of gender equality. And I became the head of gender equality policy for the United Kingdom, well, for England and Wales, um, which meant I had a lot to do with my fellows, my fellow gender equality experts across Europe, because it is a gender equality is, is a European wide policy. And beyond that, um, uh, globally, because gender equality is an issue which is taken very seriously at the United Nations. And so I was able to speak for the UK at the Commission for the Status of Women, which is the annual commission at the United Nations on gender equality. So I've had lots of different kinds of experience. And for me, that has been one of the most interesting things about a career in public administration which is that there are so many opportunities to do so many different things. Anyway, that's my background. The floor to Bartosz now to tell you about his background. Thank you, Liz. Uh, as I was said before, my name is Bartosz Szota. Uh, I'm a, a Polish uh, civil servant. Uh, servant. Uh, I have some uh, economic and management uh, background. I studied the Warsaw School of Economics. Uh, then, because it was a very hard uh, time on our labour market, uh, I had a chance to, uh, to be a student of National School of Public Administration in Warsaw. So I did nearly the same course as uh, you did uh, 10 years ago. Uh, after that I got a chance to work for Ministry of uh, Scientific Research and uh, IT Technologies. Uh, I was the uh, uh, head of uh, HR unit. Uh, then again, uh, I returned to my analytical uh, work. I worked uh, for Ministry of Finance for two years, and uh, after that, uh, I returned to my uh, first, uh, first and uh, best uh, job. So back to Ministry of Scientific Research and Higher uh, Education, and uh, I used to be a, a, a director of human resources. For a few years, uh, we were also doing some interesting things with project connected with uh, goal, manag uh, goal management, uh, risk management, and um, organizational uh, excellence. So, uh, but nowadays I'm concentrating uh, professionally on uh, things connected with talent management. And if you have enough patience, we will uh, come back to the topic uh, later. So, thanks. Please, your floor. Okay, we're, we're here as part of a project, a European Union project, which is providing support to the Ukrainian civil service, particularly in the field of strategic planning and human resource management. We're very pleased to be here to speak to you today, and we hope to be seeing perhaps some of you again in a couple of weeks' time. We've decided today... Um, to divide our time in two, into two chunks, two parts. Um, and we're, going to, we're both talking about our ideas on improvement of public administration, but I'm going to begin by discussing how recent experience in my country, the United Kingdom, has made me reflect again on the importance of the ethical basis of public administration. And then Bartosz, as he, as he intimated earlier, as he hinted earlier, will talk about one of the big challenges in the strategic, strategic management of human resources in public administration. So, 
ethical basis of a democratic public administration in Europe. Why does doing public administration properly really matter? Elected governments, a free press, freedom of speech, an independent judiciary, and human rights. These are the measures by which we Europeans, and we of course include Ukraine in this, are judged. These are the values which we must continually cherish. They are things which are easy to say, but difficult to maintain in practice. The thing that made me think about this particularly of my, in, in the United Kingdom was what happened to us last week. Last week in the United Kingdom we had an important referendum. The UK, the United Kingdom, is made up, as I'm sure you know, of four separate countries. England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Scotland has been part of the United Kingdom for over 300 years. Scotland is in the north. If you imagine we're a big triangle, Scotland is in the north. If any of you have been to Scotland, you will know that it's quite difficult to understand what they're saying. It's difficult for me to understand what they're saying because their accent is very, very strong. They racially... Many Scots are, uh, come from a different, the whole United Kingdom was made up of waves of invaders from different parts of the world. And the Scots um, come from a different racial group than many of the people who live in the South. Scots typically have red hair. Um, I know a lot of Slavic peoples also have red hair. I can look round here and I can see red hair. And don't think it all comes out of a bottle. <laughs> um, when I was younger, I too had red hair, but I'm not. I'm not Scottish, so that's not true of me. But they have a different. They have a, a strong accent. They have a fiery temper that goes with their red hair. <clears throat> but Scotland has been part of the United Kingdom for over 300 years. Wales has been part of the United Kingdom for even longer. And Northern Ireland has a much uh, more recent and more troubled history. And I'm sure you were aware of that. Each country has similarities and differences. For example, Wales has a vibrant language of its own. And Welsh, the Welsh language, is part of compulsory education for all children in Wales who have to learn Welsh until they're 16. Some people, some children, still grow up with Welsh as their first language, not English. Each country has its own history, which has, to a greater or lesser extent, shaped its culture and its values. But there is completely free movement between each country. Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have their own elected parliaments with a certain amount of control over domestic policies. Both Wales and Scotland have strong nationalist movements with political parties that are strongly represented in their respective parliaments. The Scottish Nationalist Party is very strong and two years ago the UK Parliament agreed to hold a referendum on independence for Scotland. Everyone aged 16 and above who lives in Scotland was entitled to vote. And the final turnout of voters, of people who voted, was 84%. I have no idea what your typical turnouts are in, in, in elections. But in the UK, that is an extraordinarily high turnout. In the recent European elections, the turnout in the UK was 32%. Mm -hmm. 
So 84%, enormous, an enormous amount of interest. Feelings about the issue of independence were passionately held and passionately expressed. It was particularly difficult for people living in England and Wales, like me, I live in England, who would be profoundly affected by the referendum outcome but had no vote because they did not live in Scotland. There are plenty of, many, many people of Scottish origin um, who consider themselves Scottish live in England and so didn't have a vote. There are many English people who live in Scotland because that's where they work and they did have a vote. Our Prime Minister, David Cameron, was clear that he wanted Scotland to stay in the UK, but he too had no influence. Indeed, Scotland generally is a left-wing country, so the fact that a Conservative right-wing Prime Minister wanted them to stay was potentially a negative influence on the outcome. Even our Queen, who has to remain politically neutral, was clearly anxious about the outcome. Although the independence plans did not include Scotland becoming a republic and the Queen would still have been head of state in Scotland. The result was unpredictable in the polls until the very last minute and the result was very close. 45% of people wanted an independent Scotland and 55% wanted Scotland to remain in the UK. That's very, very tight, very close. So Scotland will remain in the UK, but the result will mean that our united, united kingdom will change. Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and also England will have more independence from one another. More independent control over taxation and over expenditure. There will be more differences between the social systems in each country. This has been and will continue to be a very difficult time for us in the UK. But those core values that I spoke about at the beginning, democratic government, free press, freedom of speech, an independent judiciary and human rights have enabled us to find a peaceful way forward to what was a very, very profoundly felt search for national identity in Scotland. A second example that troubles the United Kingdom is the challenge we face in building a safe country which can hold within its boundaries peoples from a wide range of different cultures and faiths, all respecting one another's different ways of living, but at the same time being part of the same country. We are a country of many different cultures. After English, the most commonly spoken language in the UK is Polish. Most large towns most towns of any size will have churches and mosques and temples, reflecting the rich variety of faiths that are widespread in the UK now. And this diversity causes great pressure for the delivery of public services. Some primary schools, that's the schools children go to when they're approaching five, and that they stay at until they are 11. Some primary schools find that half their children do not speak English at home, which causes difficulties in the classroom because lessons are all in English and teachers have to first of all teach their little children to speak English before they can teach them anything else. Some faiths have very strict dietary restrictions. This causes problems in the delivery of public services in public institutions, such as hospitals or prisons, which provide food for patients 
and for prisoners. Within some of our larger cities, there can be problems of public order with the development of gangs, with religious or racial loyalties. Now, these challenges are not unique to the United Kingdom. In different forms, they are replicated throughout Europe and globally. The role of public administration in meeting challenges like these is vital. Elected politicians must provide the general direction because they have the mandate from the people. But the detail, how we move from where we find ourselves now to where we wish to be, what we would call policy, and how we deliver services to everybody, irrespective of their culture, their faith, their origins, all of those have to be worked through by civil servants, by public administrators. And that's why the ethical foundation of the civil service matters. A civil service must have the trust of all other stakeholders in a nation. Politicians must know they can depend on the civil service for impartial and honest advice, for complete honesty and for propriety in the way appointments are made and in the way resources are spent. The press must, knows, must know that they can speak truth to power with, without fear and that their right to do so will be protected by the civil service and by the judicial system. The civil service must uphold the independence of the judiciary and must act in ways that are consistent with the European Convention on Human Rights, which is a convention not of the European Union, but of the Council of Europe, a much wider organisation. And these core ethics of the public service will ensure, and I would say are the only way of ensuring, that we meet challenges now and in the future. Whatever our role as individuals within the public service, we have an obligation to carry out our duties and responsibilities with integrity. And this is especially important in two areas, financial management and human resource management. Public trust in the way in which public services are delivered is vital to national stability and national success. We must never forget that public finances are taxpayers' money. It's not our money, it's not profit, it's not money we have earned. It's money that is entrusted to the civil service through the taxation system. People will never enter public administration. You will not enter public administration. You are not part of public administration to find the best or the highest financial rewards. If you are, I can tell you, you might as well leave now because the best and highest financial rewards are not to be found in public administration and nor should they be. But you should be rewarded fairly for these skills and experience you bring and for what you achieve. Human resource systems must ensure that public administration attracts and retains people with the right competences to meet the challenges of working in the public sector and attracting and retaining good people within an employment framework that is consistent with the best public service values is a challenge in all public administrations. My colleague is now going to offer you some insights into how to actually make this work in this important area. So, uh, people and management putting it together to make the best, uh, the best of it. Uh, it's uh, like you know uh, asking the IT guy 
uh, if computers are the most important. Of course, he will say that they are important. So, uh, people from uh, HR units will always tell you that uh, people are the most important. Because, uh, but they are not telling it uh, without any any hints. So people cannot be easily replaced. Of course, you can you can sack people, but then you have to retrain the new ones. It costs money, time, and other, uh, and so probably uh, the new ones will not be as good as the one you fired. Uh, people's competences cannot be easily copied. It's not like people are not like machines. You cannot uh, order five computers. No, you are hiring five people. Uh, each of them is uh, uh, individual. It has its own talents, its own competences, and also, uh, yeah, they, they are not the same. And also, the most important uh, thing of, uh, of people in organization is that they are creating value for their organization and for uh, organization stakeholders. Without, uh, without this uh, value, we will be just like, uh, like machines. The uh, creativity, uh, our ideas and our, what we believe are creating this value that is uh, valuable for uh, the others, for uh, clients, society, nation and so on. So, if people are that important, that is, this is uh, crucial that they are uh, well managed. Because if, if, if you have a precious resource, then you, you want to be sure that this uh, resource uh, is uh, well managed. And that is why we have a concept of human resource management. So uh, I brought a Wikipedia definition, I mean, it wasn't that re refined. So it's a function uh, in organization designed to maximize employee performance in service of the employee's strategic objectives. So we have two interesting points here. So, Maximizing employee performance, it's kind of uh, obvious. So uh, we want that our workers, our employees, are uh, doing the best they can. But not doing uh, anything. No, they, they work should be, uh, should be uh, concentrated on very important things. Because if they are important, we want, uh, we want them to do important things. It's kind of obvious. I was just wondering uh, once why, so we have many companies, some companies, some organizations are just uh, thriving, uh, generating a lot of uh, money and the other are not. Uh, and I was just uh, wondering why it happens, why uh, one, some organizations succeed and the other fails and I sketched uh, it's not the only uh, way of thinking, but it's one of the possible thinking. So, why? Because they are better than, than the others. Yeah, we've got good companies and bad companies, good organization and better organizations. Why? Maybe because they have better resources. And why they have better resources? It's, 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 it should be obvious that uh, they should have uh, the same. No. Because some companies, some organizations are better in uh, obtaining, uh, employing and uh, retaining those resources. And why they are better? They should be the same. No. Uh, again, they are doing it well, along with their plan. So they have a kind of a strategic vision of how to obtain, employ and retain those important and valuable resources. Okay, so now uh, let me let me go through the two <coughs> most basic approaches to the organization functioning: uh, market-based view and resource-based view of uh, organization. I know that this is theory, but this is uh, this is useful theory. So, market-based view, uh, as you may uh, as you may know, is connected with uh, uh, quite a clever guy, Michael Laporta. Uh, who, was, uh, who, uh, who believes that uh, the um, success of organization uh, is connected with uh, unique competences of the uh, company. And uh, the, the company is uh, functioning along with five forces which have the great impact on the uh, company uh, functioning. 
those forces are generally external uh, to the uh, organization. So it's the force of clients, force of the uh, sector itself, the company is working, and, and so on. So this kind of uh, approach is not very uh, practical when we are thinking about uh, organization like uh, public administration. Because we have, of course, we can uh, uh, name our stakeholders like clients. We have uh, our competition, but it's not that, uh, that appropriate. So I believe the, the second view, resource-based view, is uh, much more adaptable to our, to our ministries and our offices. Uh, this view concentrates on resources. Uh, Mr. Barney, Penrose and the others are saying that uh, to have a sound and thriving organization you have to have uh, resources that gives you a comparative advantage over the other organizations. And uh, those, uh, because we are living in a world when everything could be easily copied, those resources who are, uh, who are giving us this advantage cannot be easily copied, cannot be uh, easily subs uh, substituted, and uh, should create value. And of course, this should uh, ring the bell that uh, these are the characteristics of people in the organization. So, based on resource-based view, once again, people are important. Yeah. But, uh, just, let's, let's, let's go back to the in time in probably it was 1970s, when the uh, two, two universities in, uh, in USA uh, found two different approaches towards strategic role of uh, people in organizations. We've got a Michigan model and Harvard model. Michigan model, called also hard human resource management, uh, was uh, first, uh, first attempt to, to put the strategic planning in human resources in the organization. Uh, so, people, in, uh, according to that model, people in, uh, in uh, the organization are treated as the other resources. They were not special. They were like machines, capital, land, and so on. They were as good as they were making uh, value for a profit for a company. So, uh, the human resource management was a tool to make full, of you, full uh, use of those uh, employees. And also, the uh, uh, human resource strategy uh, so was overridden by the uh, overall strategy of the company. Uh, as you may expect, uh, it, uh, it was heavily criticized. And uh, then we got Harvard model. This is a soft uh, human resource management. So, uh, in this model, we have different stakeholders, like employees, uh, labor unions, uh, owners of the company, politicians, and so on, are influencing the human resources management. <coughs> Employees, as you, can, as you may uh, imagine, are quite significant stakeholders in, in this, uh, in this uh, approach. So the uh, decisions in the, in the uh, human resource field uh, influence the motivation, efficiency, and the employees' well-being. And there's a, a quite a positive link between human resources, so the employees, and the uh, functioning of the company. But uh, this is so. So uh, those two models can can uh, really function in uh, today companies. It's not like uh, we are talking about uh, something very old and uh, forgotten. No, they are they are still with us. But the latest, uh, latest approach to the, uh, to the human resources is so-called human capital model. In, so human capital management <coughs> is an approach to, in, to employee staffing that perceives people as assets, whose current value can be measured and whose future value can be enhanced through investment. Well, very nice definition, but what it, what it means. So, 
In this model, people are not simple resources. They are not the most important resources. They are even more. They are the only uh, valuable thing. Uh, thing. The, the, uh, they are the uh, only valuable uh, resource the company can have. And investment in people can bring profit, can bring value, as, you can, as we can say in, uh, in our type of organization. But there is one, one but. The sh decisions uh, should be uh, about whether to invest in people or not invest are based on gathered data and calculations. So you can calculate if it's worth it to invest in a person or not. If the value uh, the person uh, brings to the company or to the organization is worth enough to invest money, time, and other means in that, that person. And let it be the, the uh, we are in a school of public administration, academy of public administration, so uh, let, me, let me just uh, recapture, recapitulate uh, about the public administration perspective. So, uh, human resources uh, in public companies, uh, private companies, and in the uh, public administration, so they are the same, but they are very different. So, uh, we are uh, ministries, for example. We are less uh, effective. Yeah, we are. We are spending sometimes. Sometimes we are spending money very, uh, uh, not very wisely. Uh, we are less adapted because we have a lot of rules we have to comply with. Uh, we have uh, okay. We can we can say that we have politicians, but of course uh, companies also have their bosses. They are not that. Uh, they are as good as our politicians. And uh, there are also the problem uh, with public administration and human resources is uh, that our targets and goals are much more unclear than the uh, private companies. They have profit, and profit is a king. And in public administration, it's very difficult to, to name what is our goal, what is our overall goal. And uh, if I'm doing it, if I'm contributing to the overall goal or not. These are uh, kind of tough questions to answer. So what to do? What I, I was just thinking, what to do with those uh, circumstances. So I believe that uh, evolutionary changes in thinking and action uh, in ad administration are the, the, the cornerstone. Because uh, we in Poland, we noticed uh, that uh, just before uh, joining the EU, we tried to implement all the tools, hard tools we could learn from Great Britain, France, Germany, and really, it, it failed. We, we put all the uh, human resource tools in our Civil Service Act, and now we have a huge act with a lot of tools nobody uses. Or uses only to, um, to comply with the law, which is, which is uh, really uh, very, uh, not very, not very wise. So, we used some of the advanced tools. Of course, I'm not saying that, no, uh, uh, that we shouldn't use any modern uh, human resources tools, but use it wisely. Choose one or two and uh, just experiment if they are working, working or not. And of course, always be prepared for uh, bigger changes in the future. So, as we can see, uh, many good companies that weren't prepared for the future are just closed, they're bankrupt. So, of course, ministries cannot uh, bankrupt, but we have to be prepared uh, for the change. And now, what I promised to you, uh, talent management in public administration. So, just like back to the beginning of, the, of the, my part of the lecture. So, we, we, we are, I was talking that people are that uh, important. And what, make, what makes people the, so important? Their creativity, their knowledge, their skills. So this is what I uh, understand uh, under the expression of talent. There's, uh, I put some definition. What is talent? A natural skill or ability? A person? 
yeah, or a power of mind or body given to a person to use uh, and improve. But uh, as you uh, as you think about talents, not all talents are needed uh, among the uh, organizations. There are many talents. They are written in the uh, World Guinness Book are useless in the uh, our day-to-day -day, uh, work in the uh, offices. So, in human resources, we should uh, seek for those talents that can, like again, generate value for the company, for the organization. And there is a lot of talents, uh, a lot of uh, different competences that can be uh, useful in our day uh, daily work. But the problem with talent is, is something like that, that I cannot give you the exact definition of talent in civil service. Because in each office, in each ministry, in each company and organization, the definition of talent is different. Of course, we can use those that is natural skill or ability, but you cannot give the catalogue of competences which makes talent. Also, the definition is uh, very changeable. Uh, what was a talent, I don't know, 10 or 20 years ago, nowadays, can be, uh, can be a, a normal situation, or maybe just, just even the liability. So, as we, uh, as we go through the talent management, there are basically five areas of talent management. First, in an organization we attract talents. So we are trying uh, to make our uh, organization good <coughs> that the uh, talented people outside the organization are willing to, to join us. When they are willing to join, we are trying to recruit them, to give them that good uh, condition, working conditions and work and salaries, uh, French benefits and so on, that they join our uh, join our organization. The other uh, step is to develop talent. So it, it is very costly to buy fully fledged talents because they are uh, high profile experts which earns a lot of money. It is uh, cheaply to find a potential talent and to develop it. Of course it's risky because it may, it may turn, out, uh, turn out that uh, this is not a talent. But Still, uh, this is much more cost efficient than buying a new. It's, it's, it's a question of make or buy dilemma. Then we are we have to be sure that we are employing uh, talent. So uh, this is the, the the worst part. If you have a talent in an organization, it is just uh, doing manual work and it's kind of wasted talent. You have to be sure that uh, the talented person is doing very important uh, work, which creates value. And then we are retaining talents, because uh, we in Poland uh, seven years ago experienced some, something very strange. Uh, it was just, uh, just before the uh, financial crisis, when uh, I was uh, there, I was a uh, personal director, and uh, I had a saying that a day without a lost employee is a lost day. Each day I lost a good worker because there was a such a pressure from public, from private companies that uh, every day we lost some, uh, someone. And uh, people are, uh, were joining my ministry just to, for 6 or 12 months just to learn the basics and then go to the uh, private sector for a triple salary. Final, uh, Fortunately, or maybe unfortunately, uh, after, uh, after the crisis came, it, it stopped. So, retaining people, retaining good people is, is very good. It's a must, because the whole cycle will be, uh, will be useless if you just let those talented people go. So, we have talent management tools, yeah, as we are progressing. So I just put a, a random list of, maybe not random, but uh, those who just uh, came to my mind uh, as, a, as a first uh, first thing. So we have succession planning. When you uh, when you uh, Google uh, talent management, this is the first will uh, show up. 
succession planning is uh, just preparing for, uh, for the future. So uh, you know that somebody will leave your uh, organization and you want to train uh, a talented person to act as a, as a person who will lead the organization. Development center is a tool for, uh, for developing talents and also to gathering data uh, about uh, potential competences of your staff and also the, um, the needs of uh, development of your talents. Uh, we are using loyalty contracts. So this was uh, my only tool to stop those people uh, within the organization. Because uh, when they have uh, a loyalty contract, uh, it, uh, it meant that they have to pay money to leave the, the, uh, the ministry. Of course, we have mentoring, we have fast track, we have privileges for talents. Uh, the, the, the one very, the nice thing is the uh, employer of the first choice. So this is the, act, uh, this is the uh, acting of an organization to be the top employer. So if you want to change uh, your work, you think about that organization. Uh, in Poland we used to think uh, as an uh, employer of the first choice about the Ministry of Finance. Because we know that the Ministry of Finance is uh, uh, you are quite well when you are you are a worker of Ministry of Finance. Now it changed, so they they couldn't uh, couldn't uh, live up to that standard anymore. And what talent management means to the public administration at all? So first of all, uh, the first positive thing is that talented people in the organization are managed. So back again, this is really uh, crucial to be sure that uh, the most valuable resource of your organization is managed. If it's not managed, maybe it's squandered. And uh, also, talent management uh, promotes higher efficiency. It uh, improves uh, motivation and increases morale. Uh, organizations, uh, organization with ta of talented people is also more flexible and uh, ready for change. Uh, if you have talented people and, uh, for example, uh, I don't know, five people in a department uh, are sick. You can, you can uh, put uh, those talents into uh, uh, those departments and they will do their work. If they are true talents. And also, talented, uh, talent management positively influences the other spheres uh, of uh, organization functioning. It, it promotes the, uh, the other processes uh, in human resources. It, uh, it, can, uh, it can have uh, positive links with Risk, risk management and also uh, uh, target-driven uh, management. So this is this is the whole uh, catalog of processes that could be enhanced uh, by introducing talent management into the organization. And uh, probably that's that's it. What I heard about talents, but uh, just just share me uh, just share me. I'm sharing with you one one thing that. Really, 10 years ago, I was uh, on the other side of the uh, lecture class. And I remember uh, those lecturers from UK and Germany coming to, to Warsaw and telling us that we are special, that we are talented people, we are talented young people, and yeah, we will change the administration. And nobody believed them. Really, we were sure that we will. Uh, we will be lost in the middle of, I don't know, uh, I don't know if you know the uh, geography of Poland, but in the middle of nowhere, in a small office, uh, working to, to our uh, retirement. But I think that those guys from UK were, weren't that wrong. And uh, look, ten years after, after 10 years after my school, I'm, maybe I'm not a millionaire, but I'm giving a quite nice uh, lecture to, to to you, and uh, yes, this, this can happen. And really, you have to just you have to be prepared for and make it happen. Okay, thank you very much. Does anybody want to ask anything, make any comment, or say anything? on anything that we've said. <laughs> <laughs>
Everything was clear. <laughs> Sorry? Everything was clear. Oh, good. Good. Thank good. you very much. Thank you for your compliments about yeah. that we are talented. <laughs> <laughs> We have the same situation in uh, Ukraine, like in Poland, that people came to ministry uh, and work there 12 months and go to international companies. <laughs> yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good grounding being in the civil service, being in public administration. It's a good training and people outside the civil service recognise it and they come and poach you. When we were talking about this um, yesterday, I was saying that we had a similar problem, well we still do, but we had a particular problem when we deregulated financial services in the United Kingdom. And suddenly there was an enormous demand for, in the private sector, in the financial services sector, for people who were, who were competent um, with budgets, with accounts, with finance, and many of them were in our Department of Trade and Industry and in our Treasury. And so the financial services companies came in and they, the word we use is poach, poach. They took, they, they attracted civil servants to their, to their new organisations with promises of lots and lots and lots of money. And they did get lots and lots and lots of money. But they were short-sighted, these companies, and they attracted perhaps the ones who they thought would be better in the cutthroat world of financial services, or perhaps the ones who were more willing to take a risk, they typically took men from the civil service, and they didn't take women. And the unexpected effect of that was that we now have very many more heads of ministries who are women now than we ever had before. Because the women who were not taken by the financial services organisations suddenly had space to operate in. They suddenly had promotion opportunities and they took advantage of them. And if you look at the top of the British civil service now, there are more women than men. And the age they are now, almost all of them benefited from the enormous exodus of men to the financial services industry when it was deregulated. I'm not saying it was, it was entirely a good thing that this happened, but there were some unexpected outcomes which turned out, in some cases, to be very beneficial. What I, uh, what I would like to add about the, this, this uh, topic is that, that not everybody is uh, able to uh, work for a private company. Uh, really, uh, my wife is working for the uh, quite a big uh, American uh, company and it's, uh, it's not that nice. Of course there are some uh, very shiny and uh, nice things, uh, maybe uh, more money and uh, going to Barcelona for, for, a, for a meeting. Yeah, but they are working really very hard and this is, this is completely different style of working. Uh, of course, there are some, uh, some similar similarities between work in administration and the uh, international company, uh, but uh, not everybody uh, is suited to work for a multinational. Really, it's, uh, when you are, if, if you are here, I believe that uh, you mostly made a choice, not to, uh, so if you are talented, and you are here, so you probably you should you should, you you decided to to work for the government, not for the multinationals. It's true. Life will show. <laughs> <laughs> we are planning um, after this session. We are planning what we are going to do. Is it the week after next? The end of the month, end of October, mm -hmm. when we're here again. Yes. It's a week from 20th yeah. to 23rd of yeah. October. Yeah. You've, you've heard two different approaches from us today. Do you have any 
particular requests of what we might do together in October. Actually, the idea is that right now, today, uh, actually today it was a lecture, uh, which in the, uh, was for two topics which were presented for you. And now maybe you have taken consideration the information that you get from the other lectures. You have maybe some comments, some ideas, what other topics uh, you would like to hear, or maybe you are interested in, in the context of today's topics. Sink. <laughs> Have a little think, yes. Yeah, so so you may sing. No, she's just having a think. Yeah. Um, the idea is that we would like, together with other experts, to conduct, like, um, now still discussing the format, maybe workshop or seminar, more practical, a lot of it, not only theory. It may be possible for us to process the whole information we heard today and tell you what we'd like to uh, make it. But still maybe to hear some ideas, at least something. Yes, yeah, sure, uh, like feedback, it will be very useful for our experts, but right now, what do you think? Yes. Maybe a kind of um, comparison or a practical application of the theory. Um, because you have shown us two different approaches today and the one we have in Ukraine is a bit different from the one you represented. Maybe it would be better or more useful for us uh, to see the practical way of these approaches just as, as an idea. Thank you. Maybe we can uh, tell about our approach in our country and you can Tell us recommendation. <laughs> so. <Ooh. laughs> I think I think you I think you have to do that. We we cannot be experts on what's happening here. We can tell you a bit about our situation. You have to then ex take from that, I think, what you think might work and talk about it amongst yourselves. We could do that if we have a day then we could break the day up by asking you to, to form small groups and talk about the practical application of the kinds of things that we're talking about to one another. But I, I think we would be very brave if we started to, to tell you how you should operate here. Because we just... Brave is a very nice word. Yeah. <laughs> But we could, we could maybe do something like, you know, getting you to talk to one another about it and then listen to what you've got to say. Yeah, we, we, uh, your group also will be participating of your second uh, year. It's, not, uh, it's actually going to be as a training kind of workshop, it's the kind of working diploma for both here, uh, for both kind of courses, for the first and second. But right now we would like to hear maybe others' comments. Or maybe questions for today's topics. Was it interesting what we talked yeah. about? Yeah. I mean, you all seem to be yeah. you all seem to be alert and paying attention. So both approaches are the kind of things that you you might be interested in a mix of those two approaches. Yes. No. Um, maybe what do you consider the hardest challenge? Uh, of implementing this approach. Okay. We like the soft model. <laughs> you like the soft model. <laughs> you don't Everybody want to be considered as a, as a resource. You want to be considered as somebody who's participative in there. Yeah. What can you consider as the hardest challenge? Yeah. What's the hardest challenge? Hmm. So, uh, taking uh, into consideration the Polish reality, the 
hardest thing is that talent management is not in our uh, Civil Service Act. It's a voluntary thing, which means that uh, nearly nobody wants it to implement it. Because, you know, uh, director generals of the ministries think uh, that way. I have to do what uh, there is uh, in Civil Service Act, and if I have spare resources, I do something uh, which is voluntary, and in mostly, mostly in uh, mostly in ministries, are just uh, restraining themselves to the, uh, what is uh, obligatory, and the voluntary uh, part is done by one or two ministries. So uh, when I was trying to find uh, uh, organization, a uh, public uh, public organization, which is which has the full model of talent management, I really, I couldn't find uh, the, 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 uh, the ministry which is doing the whole cycle. They have some instruments, but still they are not uh, implementing the whole thing. And why? Because they are doing things which are, uh, which are, uh, which are uh, said uh, by the supervised by the ministers and which are uh, provided uh, in the civil service act. And if we have it, if this uh, tool was obligatory, then probably we will have uh, much more uh, talent management. But there is one uh, one problem. Uh, as I said before, uh, those uh, instruments that are obligatory. Uh, some of them are just uh, implemented uh, for the sake of being implemented. Those ministries who are voluntarily uh, doing some uh, talent management are uh, doing it from its own will and they want to implement it. And there is a, there is a, a huge difference between an uh, organization which is forced to implement some uh, human resource tools and the organization that wants to implement it. We don't have a civil service act in the United Kingdom, so we don't we don't start from a position of saying, well, if it's in the act, people will do it. If it's not in the act, it's more difficult. It's all more difficult for us. It's all about persuasion. So, if we wanted to introduce a system of talent management across all the ministries, the way it would be done would be by um, making the heads of the ministries, of whom there's a relatively small number, um, less than 30, accountable in their own performance contract for talent management within their organisation. And then you would find that would be in their performance objectives for the year. And then they would have to ensure that it was in the performance objectives of their senior team and then they would have to ensure, in turn, that it, <coughs> it kind of went down like that. Um, because we don't have a Civil Service Act, um, we, we have to, it would be, it's just incredibly countercultural in the UK context. You know, this is a country without a constitution, mm -hmm. so we're certainly never going to have a Civil Service Act. Um, so we have to find other ways of doing it, and ours is through systems of performance management which are um, strongly supported within the organization uh, and that that's how we introduce changes of this sort So we have one more uh, thing to come on. We have the same in Poland. Yeah, but because this is a question of uh, organization culture. Uh, in public administration, I'm not talking about the uh, Anglo Saxon model, but. Uh, I think it's across the board this one. Uh, when you are a boss, 
it is better for you, listen, being a bad boss, uh, it's better for you that you have uh, somebody who is maybe not a genius, but is doing its uh, work, and uh, somebody who is not uh, able to be your substitute, somebody who is not uh, doing some risky things, because what you will uh, what you will get if you do some uh, improvement in your organization probably nothing and if it fails you will uh, you will get uh, some negative uh, feedback from your boss that is why the taking risk in an administration is not uh, welcomed because as, uh, as I said uh, in my, my part of lecture uh, we don't have that uh, profit orientation because if uh, we conduct a project and we generate uh, a lot of profit then we have a shield to defend ourselves but when we don't have a profit everybody can uh, can say that uh, what we done is uh, counterproductive and uh, and uh, we cannot defend ourselves. And that is why talented people are having a hard time because their talents are pos uh, possible threats uh, toward uh, their supervisors. If, and this is, the, this is the whole thing, how to make those talented people, how to employ those talented people, to make them uh, use the talents and uh, it, it, so you don't, uh, it's uh, partly it's uh, about talents, but also it's about uh, daily supervisors. And of course, I, I don't have uh, the answer how, to, how we should do it, because even in Poland we, we have uh, some good and bad uh, practices. So, so maybe um, the problem is that uh, supervisors are afraid to be fired, and replaced by these talented people, so they just don't supervise the ability to but, implement. You know, uh, being a talent doesn't mean that you are a good supervisor. This is this is uh, this is kind of tricky because uh, you can be great in great uh, uh, analyst. You can be you can know five uh, foreign languages, but it doesn't make you a good boss. So, uh, and also, uh, you know, uh, revolutionary changes in, in administration is, uh, happens sometimes, but uh, there is a lot of uh, casualties in it. So, uh, firing uh, supervisors, it's, uh, it's not, a, not the, uh, the recommended uh, way. Probably, probably uh, evolutionary changes will, will be more uh, productive. Uh, say, uh, I said not firing, but replacing, replacing. these supervisors who are mm, but how to replace? not so talented by these talented people. You know, I, as a uh, personal director, uh, I uh, understand uh, replace as, you know, as well.
from my experience, uh, a big company, big international company, has less processes, as I, you know, less processes than the small uh, public uh, administration office. Companies uh, are not that complicated as public administration. Uh, which uh, what, what, what it means that uh, changing uh, public uh, changing private companies can be quite uh, easily done, and when you are trying to change public administration, there is so many things you have to consider, so many uh, aspects of uh, running not only an organization but also sometimes when you are reorganizing ministry you are also reorganizing the whole sector of the economy or, or the society. So, of course, uh, companies can offer you more because uh, they can see direct uh, uh, impacts of your work. In public administration, we, we vaguely see the uh, effects of our work. Sometimes we, we, we don't see the, those effects at all because we can we can uh, work for a year or two for uh, or the uh, bill of uh, le le legislation and uh, the bill will not uh, pass through the parliament and our work is, is wasted. But still, we are, we are doing it uh, for the sake of uh, society or the, of the nation and uh, of course it's, it's nice to compare the salary from the uh, private company to the uh, public administration and those who are working for private companies are uh, earning more. But uh, uh, if you compare only the numbers, uh, of course the private companies will win, always, in each country. They, are, they, they have uh, more to offer. But, uh, there are many things in public administration you can do which you cannot do in uh, private companies. For example, uh, for me it's uh, very very nice to uh, walk around uh, different uh, different ministries. Yeah, I was uh, in Ministry of uh, IT Technologies, I was Ministry of Finance, now I'm Ministry of uh, Science and Higher Education. Probably I will uh, I will go to the three or four more uh, organizations in the next ten years. This is this is kind of uh, things. Of course, in private and in private companies, uh, probably you will be at the hard model. They will do everything to make you uh, earn for your pay. How this that's how the companies work. You will, ne you will never find somebody working in a private company who will agree with what I'm about to say. But working in public administration is incredibly difficult. In the tasks we have to do, do are very much harder than the tasks that have to be achieved in a private company. It's much more complicated, much more complicated. And that is part of the attraction of the work. Because it is difficult. It is intellectually challenging. It, you need to be clever. As well as all the other things you need to be. You need to be clever to work in public administration. The other thing I'd like to say, just to add on, is that, is that I don't know if you study yet um, organisation structures. But um, bureaucracy is often described as a pathological organization structure. It is an organization that has gone mad in some ways. It's got stuck. And almost all government ministries are bureaucracies because bureaucracies are very good at some things that government need to be good at. They're very good at being relatively transparent. They're very good at delivering the same result in the same set of circumstances across a wide range of a wide geographical area. There are all kinds of reasons why bureaucracies can be very efficient, but they are also the most difficult organisation to work in, particularly for people who are bright, creative, and all the things that we need to have in our bureaucracies. 
this, this discussion is making me reflect on a topic that we might touch on next time, which is um, for you when you become managers, when you become supervisors, we might look at the kinds of things that you can do to be better at that, so that you create an environment where talent can flourish. Would that, would that be something that we might talk about? You being better managers? Yeah. <laughs> I just want to add to something. Yeah. I think uh, I meant, uh, meant that uh, on the, in public service uh, there are uh, uh, not so many prospects of career development as in private sector. Uh, we cannot. Uh, uh, A, a big uh, salary for workers, and uh, they have to leave private sector and uh, go to private sector or public for private. Sector. And in this private sector, they become <coughs> specialists involving maybe interest of these private companies in public. Uh, so they know how it works, how it's better to uh, develop the interest of these companies. <laughs> I, th I think you're right and not right at the same time. You're like Schrodinger's cat, you know, you're alive and not alive at the same moment. You're, you're, you're absolutely right that a bureaucracy can be stifling. Stifling? can be like that for an individual who's bright, who wants to get promoted, who wants to do more, take more responsibility. It can be really, really tough. But you are the generation in whose hands lies the possibility of change. You know, there are a lot of you. You will be all over the place when you, when you, when you have your jobs, when you have your posts. You can work to make things better for you and for those who follow you. So. And just one thing about uh, being an expert, but not in this case, no. Uh, I was shocked that, because uh, someday I was looking for a person to, to do the uh, hardcore uh, human resources, you know, the, the documentation and so on, labor law. And we were. It was. It was. A, uh, it was a recruitment procedure, and all it was ladies, all, 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 only ladies, and all those uh, uh, girls from private companies uh, knew uh, one tenth of the knowledge, uh, of the expertise, uh, of the uh, candidates from the. Public sector, really, it was it was shocking for me that uh, the, the the women from the uh, uh, private companies were uh, didn't know the basic rules of uh, labor law, and they were practicing it for a few years. So uh, maybe maybe it's a it's a bad example, but in this uh, this example, really. Uh, People uh, in public administrations are much better experts than in private companies. Maybe, maybe it doesn't it doesn't fit in no, I don't know IT sector. Maybe those uh, guys are much better than our IT guys in the ministries. But uh, for example, uh, the, the same applies to the uh, to lawyers. Uh, our lawyers in ministry are much better than those in the, or maybe not in the top uh, top uh, law firms in Warsaw, but the regular they are better than regular uh, lawyers just just in private companies. What you said is show that uh, those are public servants are better. Are better experts. Are experts in, uh, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, they are uh, worse paid. Then no, uh, the government isn't able to pay uh, millions of <coughs> money, money for these experts, and they are forced to 
gold from public service and gold to private sector. So they could um, Yes, but yes. This, is a, this is a problem not only for uh, Ukraine, not only for Poland, but it happens uh, all the world. Uh, companies, yeah, and there's, there is no good answer for it. Really, there are some, uh, some incentives uh, for, uh, for experts to stay within the uh, uh, public administration. But in terms of money, uh, government will always lose. But there is not, uh, the, the thing is that it's, uh, it's not only money. But money is very important. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The most, the most suffering uh, area is the IT sector in our civil servant. The most what? Uh, suffering. 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 Suffering sector is IT, is it? Yes. Because they're all going out. Uh, no, they uh, can't uh, came into civil servant yes. uh, because they don't have. Uh, Experience in public sector. Right. They don't take from uh, outside. Right. Of public sector. Mm. Actually, it comes up to problems. They do not need uh, a lot of experience in public service. Mm. And it's hard to work uh, without IT specialists. Impossible. Mm. Yeah. Impossible. Okay. Any any other topics that people would like to suggest? Ideas, topics, comments, something like this. Any? It, will it be okay if we do a bit of talking by us and then trying to promote some general discussion? Would that be? I mean, we could talk to you all the time, but I think that's 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 not the most helpful conversation. Yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Conversation discussion. Okay, thank you very much.